Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker has traveled here all the way from Malaysia, and I'm very happy to have also the perspectives from Asia. As we began with Europe to the USA, we're now moving in the direction of Asia. Mr. Azriel Mod Amin is the chief executive of the Center for Human Rights Research and Advocacy, which he founded in 2014. He's also the head of the delegation of Muslim NGOs to the Malaysian Universal Periodic Review, UPR, United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva since 2013, and he's an active campaigner for children's internet protection rights as well as for Rohingya uh, refugees. He'll be speaking on ASEAN human rights mechanisms, EU assistance to the NGO sector. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Azriel Mot Amin. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Um, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation and also in particular to Mr. Ogmondor Johannesson for including me in the panel, in the panel discussion for today. Um, I would like to share with uh, the audience um, the Malaysian experience in human rights as a, as a, as a brief discussion and also uh, the, in the context of ASEAN and also I, I, I will uh, touch a bit on the hopes by the civil society organizations in, in getting uh, assistance from uh, EU institutions in particular. Um, this is a particularly daunting task for me because I'm not uh, a, a good speaker, but um, having in, been involved with uh, human rights activism for the past uh, almost uh, 16 years in my country, and having uh, critically observed uh, the situation in ASEAN, I think it is about time that uh, we move forward to, to be more aggressive in, in working with the, our partners from other regions, in particular from the EU. Um, uh, and I, I, I will share with you how actually in the ASEAN context we need uh, some form of assistance, uh, not only in building our capa capabilities, but also in uh, more of a, sort of a partner, uh, partnership uh, form and not as a merely donor and donors. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'll touch a bit on the, on the human rights in the Malaysian constitution just to share with you uh, some brief aspects of, uh, of our situation in Malaysia and also in Asia. Uh, Malaysia is no, stronger, no stranger to the concept of human rights, having first recognised such, such rights when we, were, when we were embedded in the federal constitution, the, the human rights were embedded in the federal constitution that came in, into force upon Malaysia's attainment of independence from Britain in 1957, part two of the Malaysian constitution, under the general heading fundamental liberties. We don't use the term human rights, but we use the, the term fundamental liberties, contains various recognized rights that are respected and practiced within Malaysia today. And among these are the right to life in Article 5, freedom from slavery, Article 6, protection from double jeopardy, Article 7, right to equality, Article 8, freedom of movement, Article 9, freedom of speech and assembly, Article 10, freedom of religion, Article 11, right to education, Article 12, and the right to property, Article 13. Um, no doubt, one can appreciate that the rights protected under the Malaysian legal system by virtue of the federal constitution are numerous, and I will not go, I will not elaborate those rights, but uh, suffice to say, it is sufficient for me to say that um, those rights are guaranteed under our federal constitution. However, uh, if you look um, critically, the realization of human rights ideals in Malaysia is not without difficulties. Historically, owing to the circumstances of Malaysia having a multi-racial mix-up as well as tumultuous history, such as the infamous racial riots of 1969, we have had a rather dacronian, dacronian legislation in place providing for detention without trial, such as the Internal Security Act 1960, as well as various emergency ordinances made pursuant to such riots, such as the Emergency Public Order and Prevention of Crime Ordinance 1969. But of late, the Malaysian Prime Minister uh, Najib Razak, as part of his political transformation program, has removed these laws. He has also sought to improve the situation by enacting the Peaceful Assembly Act 2012, which regulates public assemblies. Unlike Section 27 of the Police Act 1967 before it, which required organizers to, of assemblies to seek police permits and the police given wide latitude on whether to grant them, this act, among others, merely requires organizers to give prior notice before calling for assemblies. 
These attempts, however, have had mixed results. While on one hand, the masses have become more emboldened to state their minds on social media, especially apart from street demonstrations, which have always been part of our culture, in spite of government attempts to suppress them, it has also, it has also led to destabilization as well as expose an old fault line of racial and religious wounds of the past from the time of the racial riots. All feelings of resentment, once pent up for the better collective good of the nation, are now openly expressed. No doubt some would think this good for the country, as there is a tendency among certain human rights commentators to argue that more, the more robust, robust the national debate, the more hope for meaningful exercise of democracy. This is not always true, however, as one may state that too much exercise of democratic rights of freedom to freedom of speech and expression, for example, can lead to instability. Such was the case when Malaysia found itself in turmoil following the 1969 racial riots, and it is not impossible to imagine Malaysia failing into a similar situation today, the relatively prosperity enjoyed at present notwithstanding. notwithstanding and nonetheless, it is not the intention to state that human rights must take a back seat and to justify authoritarianism in the name of keeping the peace. Malaysia has always taken human rights seriously as a response to the 1993 adoption of the Paris Principles relating to the status of national institutions at the United Nations, which stipulated, among others, that nations must establish a national institution to promote and protect human rights. Malaysia responded by enacting the Human Rights Commission Act in 1999. The Act complies with the Paris Principle in that it establishes as an institution known as the Suruhanjaya Hak Asasi Manusia, or Human, Human Rights Commission, and vests it with the authority to submit recommendations for the government for the formulation of legislation and administrative directives, and also to recommend accession to human rights instruments that Malaysia has yet to subscribe to. The, also, the Act also vests Suhakam with with power to have due regard for the UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, so far as it is not inconsistent with the Malaysian Constitution. Suakam began operations in 2000. The Act also implements the Paris Principles call for pluralist representation thereon, with Section 5.3 ensuring that members of Suakam must be from various religious and racial backgrounds. Unfortunately, however, the Act does not fully apply the contents of the Paris Principles. For one, while the Paris Principles call for the independence in the operation of the national institution, the Human Rights Commission Act Malaysia 99 makes no provision for this. Accordingly, in practice, SWAKAM is thought of an, as an ineffective uh, agent operationally. It is said to be a toothless, ti toothless tiger, or even worse, as its recommendations are frequently and routinely ignored by both the Malaysian government and the parliament. Further, while the Act provides SWAKAM to inquire into any complaint made by any aggrieved party or of its own motion into possible violations of human rights by virtue of subsection 12, clause 2 of the Act, SWAKAM is barred from inquiring into any matter that it is, is the subject matter proceedings before a court or has been finally determined by a court. Subsection 12.3 directs that Suaka must cease to inquire into any matter that subsequently appears before a court. This conflicts with the Paris Principles, which provides that a national institution must freely consider any question that falls within its competence. Perhaps the Malaysian government would do well to do away with this anomaly, as national courts are not typically considered final arbitrators for matters to do with human rights. And indeed, like any Westminster-based model, the Malaysian parliament can and should necessarily be able to override any outcome from courts that do not accord with human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, I would, I would like to touch a bit on the, the position of ASEAN in the context of human rights, just to share, because I've come where, from far uh, to share with you on, on our experience and also some of the developments uh, on, on the ASEAN uh, regional grouping. Uh, ASEAN, of which Malaysia is a member, was incorporated by the ASEAN Charter, of which Article 14 therefore, thereof stipulated that ASEAN shall endeavour to establish a regional human rights body looking into the human rights affairs of its members. Consequently, 
In 2009, there was established the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, AICHR. The AICHR representatives come from different backgrounds and experience and serve a three-year term of office and are guided by the terms of reference, which contains the 14 mandates and functions of AICHR. Among these was to formulate its own ASEAN Declaration of Human Rights, taking into account the needs and peculiarities of ASEAN member states. Thereafter, the declaration was drafted and adopted unanimously by member states in 2012. This declaration draws on the existing UDHR and affirms that human rights belong to women, children, the elderly, and persons with disabilities, migrant workers, and vulnerable and marginalized groups. Besides, affirming all the civil and political rights already contained in the UDHR and ICCPR, this declaration also affirms all economic, social, and cultural rights contained in the UDHR with enhancements, such as the rights to safe drinking water and sanitation, protection from discrimination of, the, of those with communicable diseases, sustainability of the environment, and most notably, the right to peace, harmony, and, sus and sus stability, which is unique to ASEAN. But within the, the same declaration, these rights must be balanced with national contexts within different political, economic, legal, <coughs> social, cultural, historical, and religious backgrounds, and must take into account national security and public order. There has been some criticism over the inclusion of limit limiting wording in the ASEAN Declaration of Human Rights, notably by the international human rights organizations such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, which claim that the declaration is a declaration of government powers disguised as a declaration of human rights by making rights subject to national laws rather than laws made to confirm to human rights. In my view, and in our official view, uh, it is apt that human rights be subject to general principles that emphasize the context of the region they operate, as rights would not be meaningful if they did not take into account the diversity of views, religions, cultures, and backgrounds of the peoples within ASEAN. Uh, we support the ASEAN Declaration as it is currently worded, becoming the basis for a future ASEAN-wide convention on human rights binding on all ASEAN member states, including Malaysia, and also support the incorporation of such a convention into, a Malaysian, into Malaysian law by domestic legislation, not unlike the Human Rights Act 1998 of the United Kingdom, which incorporates the European Convention on Human Rights into its domestic law. Perhaps I should touch on a bit on the expectations and orientation after giving uh, you the context of uh, Malaysia and also ASEAN. Um, the advent of the ASEAN Charter in 2007 has raised hopes in the region for the promotion and protection of human rights. Not only does the Charter refer to human rights several times and an ex and as an axiom for the region, but also it acts as an anchor for the setting up of a human rights body in the region, which was one done in the context of AICHR. And currently, the overarching body has been set up in the form of AI AICHR, and this is complemented by two sectoral bodies, which is uh, the ICW, ICWC, the ASEAN Commission on Women and Children, and also the ASEAN ICWM, which is the ASEAN Commission on Migrant Workers. <coughs> Beyond the current preoccupation uh, of the ASEAN um, Declaration of Human Rights, other avenues weighed in terms of more concrete entrench entrenchment of human rights in the region, including a potential human rights, ASEAN Human Rights Convention or specific conventions on, on particular issues. Uh, therefore, I'm, I'm here actually to, to reach out further and to respond to the quest of, for original human rights mechanism, here or elsewhere, premised on the need of checks and balances in the, in the exercise of power and the need to build an effective and accessible system for the promotion and protection of human rights from the national to the regional, complemented by the multilateral. The simple philosophy behind this approach is that human rights are here and it should be the business of everyone, including for us from ASEAN region. The expectations facing ASEAN are thus high, especially as a consequence of the charter and the birth of the various bodies mentioned before. The challenge now is to progress beyond the legitimization of human rights through those anti points to the actualization of human rights in terms of genuine protection and implementation of human rights. 
To these ends, various orientations invite cooperation and assistance from within the ASEAN region and beyond, including by means of bilateral and interregional aid, pinpointing uh, these priorities for European partners especially. I would like to uh, suggest that with the support of European partners, that uh, they should, number one, help to strengthen the work of the AICHR on the implementation of its work plan, such as, the, such as on corporal social responsibility and migration issues, targeting the future five years review of AICHR to fortify its protection role, support the activities of the two bodies, the ACWC and also ACWM, targeting the, uh, especially to address the issue of violence against women and children, and assist, support um, uh, civil society and various informal channels, including through educational institutions in the region to enforce their role in human rights protection and promotion. Uh, perhaps uh, that is uh, what I can share for today, and uh, we can uh, discuss in any other issues which relate to uh, the ASEAN human rights context and also how uh, our European partners can actually help us in promoting and protecting human rights. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amin.